Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, uh, a short lecture I'm going to do for you over uh, Chapter 4 in um, Theory and Practice of Counseling and Psychotherapy for your Theories class. Uh, we're starting at Chapter 4, by the way, instead of going through 1, 2, and 3, because the materials in 1, 2, and 3 are covered pretty thoroughly in other courses and I don't want to spend a great deal of time on redundancies if I can get away with it. Uh, of course, you're f feel free to read chapters 1, 2, and 3. Uh, Dr. Corey has um, you know, got a lot to say about pretty near everything that has to do with counseling and psychotherapy, and it's, and it's worthwhile. But we're going to uh, start lecturing uh, today and start our discussions today uh, in chapter four with psychoanalysis and Sigmund Freud and his contemporaries. Uh, I, did I hear some eyes roll just now? I thought I did. Uh, what are we talking about Sigmund Freud for? He doesn't have anything to do with substance abuse and substance abuse counseling, does he? Yeah. Matter of fact, he did a little writing on cocaine after he did a lot of cocaine. <laughs> yeah. So it got kind of creative there for a while. Um, and uh, he actually did write some uh, uh, studies on how he could use cocaine to help cure alcohol and opium inebriates, uh, which by the way, it's not good for that, just in case you're wondering. Uh, but uh, uh, Freud is a, uh, uh, is, Basically, the father of my, uh, father of modern psychiatry, and and uh, the the work that we do, the very practical and pragmatic counseling services that we provide to uh, uh, to our clients, uh, uh, owes a lot to Dr. Freud and what and what he was doing. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen with you and get over here to some uh, information I have for you. Uh, and we'll take it from uh, take it from there. Sigmund Freud and the psychoanalyst. That's what we're going to talk about. So, what is a psychotherapy thing anyway? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, uh, generally, it's understood to mean treatment for mental emotional disorders, and we do that through psychological rather than medical means. Uh, although uh, psychotherapy today may include use of medications, and there's lots of psychotherapeutics to deal with things like anxiety, uh, thought disorders, these type and symptoms that are associated with that. Uh, but uh, when you ask someone what psyche, uh, sometimes they have a hard time uh, explaining uh, what that may be. Psyche, uh, according to old Greek mythology, and, um, uh, is a human woman whose beauty rivaled that of the goddess Venus. Uh, and uh, Psyche incited so much jealousy in Venus that she sent her son Eros to Earth to take her out in a, a kind of a divine hitman. Uh, we're familiar with that concept, by the way, if you read the, the, the Bible, particularly the Old Testament. Uh, but uh, for the Greek, psyche meant soul or spirit. And since therapy is healing, psychotherapy literally means healing of the soul. And that's kind of romantic. Uh, not particularly descriptive for what we're doing today necessarily, but it doesn't preclude that either. Uh, anyway, what did we do before we had counselors? Counseling is a relatively new uh, uh, profession. I mean, it's only been around a little over 100 years ago, at least in the form that we know it. But counseling has been around a long time, uh, and uh, it was religion. Uh, and I'm not acquainting myself with... Uh, uh, with uh, uh, you know, a priest or, uh, or a holy man or anything like that. I'm just saying that that's where people went when they had problems. They went to see their preacher. They talked to their rabbi. Uh, they went to the medicine man. They laid offerings at Lord Ganesh's uh, feet. They con consorted with Baphomet. 
uh, you know, and religion was where we went to get guidance, instruction, forgiveness, understanding, uh, whatever it was that was that was bothering us. And there, you know, there were religions all over the place. There are about five hundred gods uh, being actively worshipped as I speak in in the world today. And every one of those religions is absolutely correct, is it not? Or is it just ours? <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, there, there are beliefs and there are a wide range and, and, and people uh, use them uh, to c create self-identity, to create their moral codes, to uh, understand who they are, what motivates them, why they do what they do, etc. And that's uh, uh, an important function that's being performed there. I just like this one. <laughs> I was looking for images to put in there, and this was this was great. <laughs> I just get a grin out of it every time I see it. You go, boy. Uh, and then there's philosophy. Uh, this is Confucius, or, or what some guy thought Confucius looks like. We have no idea what he really looked like any more than we have any idea what Jesus looked like. Uh, but uh, we don't know what uh, uh, Aristotle and Plato uh, look like. Plato's the one with his finger pointing up. Aristotle is, has his hand leveled over the ground. Keep things on, keep your feet on the ground there, Plato. And Plato says, no, there's forms out there in the heavens. It's above us, and it's greater than we are, etc. cetera. Uh, this uh, lovely gentleman here who looks a little bit like me, uh, is Karl Marx, uh, and this is his writing partner and colleague down here, Joseph Engels, uh, and they are some really significant um, uh, philosophers of our time, but, they, but, but, but there are uh, uh, of relatively modern times. But uh, how did this, uh, where did these ideas come from? Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx, these two guys I just showed you, uh, wrote uh, uh, the Communist Manifesto, and uh, the, which is uh, basically telling the world what the workers of the world, uh, how the workers of the world are going to change it, and how we're alienated from ourselves because we don't have control of, of capital, uh, and uh, how the world is such that as we create the world, it creates us in a dialectic. And control of materials is what is the power that drives that dialectic. Thus, communism is born, dialectical materialism. Uh, these ideas are going on at the time uh, Freud's in his formative stage. This, uh, these books, the Communist Manifesto and Marx's very powerful Das Kapital, the capital, uh, uh, were published uh, uh, right around the time of Freud's birth. And so he grew up in uh, an age where these radical different ideas about society, government, uh, uh, people in their place in the world uh, were happening. These uh, uh, at around the time also of Freud's birth, we saw some really uh, huge, uh, uh, some really huge uh, shifts in societies that uh, uh, had to do with the industrial revol revolution, people moving from agrarian societies into industrial societies, and nations not getting along very well with one another. Uh, we had over here the Franco-Prussian War that was taking place in the 1860s, the American Civil War that was taking place in the 1860s, around the time Freud was born. Uh, and uh, Freud grew up in a society, and he lived in a society that was transformative, that was in a state of flux. The world was changing. Uh, and there were conflicts all over the place. Freud's um, idea of human development, his idea of who we are and how we are, 
comes from struggles that are internal struggles and external tr struggles, and they create us to, uh, it's almost, uh, almost Marxian and how we change the world and the world changes us, etc. Well, where did these two pretty ladies come in from? Well, they came in uh, uh, because Freud's Vienna uh, was a Victorian Vienna. Freud came to his uh, maturity in, the, in the, the period of time we call Victorian. Uh, and the Victorian Europe that Freud lived in was a, uh, a kind of a, kind of a, a split personality, if you will, to to, as, to to think of it that way. They said one thing, but they did another. Uh, the uh, when you think of Victorians, you, uh, look at these ladies. They. Uh, 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 they're very prim, they're proper, their uh, dresses, the sleeves go all the way down to their wrists, uh, their uh, skirts uh, go all the way down uh, to the floor. Under those skirts are petticoats and slips and button-up boots and pantalones and uh, uh, all of the and bustles and you name it, and they're, uh, you know, uh, covered and corseted and protected and all of that kind of good stuff uh, because uh, Sigmund, this is Sigmund, uh, and he's one who noted this, uh, is that uh, the Victorian society was a sexually repressed society. Uh, and we had this going on in the world uh, while uh, these are uh, prostitutes, <laughs> in case you were wondering. Uh, uh, this is a Victorian couple. I won't say she's a prostitute, I don't know. The rest of them, yes, they're doing their trade. Uh, this is the face of empire. Uh, Freud grew up in a sexually, and, and functioned in a sexually repressed culture where they said one thing and did another. Everybody was prim and proper here, except on the other side of town where they weren't. Uh, they were care Freud grew up when Europeans were taking the white man's burden all over the world. This uh, was a magazine cover from back at that time, The Face of Empire. And this shows a European, and he looks more Dutch than German, uh, I mean, than uh, English. But uh, he's got his rifle, he's uh, doing a ta da as he uh, sets astride the entire continent of Africa, uh, where uh, Europeans went uh, in uh, Africa, uh, poor Africa. We uh, took slaves from there and brought them to the Caribbean and uh, to, uh, to the United States and forced them into involuntary servitude and things like that. King Leopold III of Belgium went to the Congo and enslaved them there uh, and uh, put a whole different twist, a whole different look on this face of empire. Uh, these are the French in a place called French Indochina. And you can see with these severed heads sitting in front of them how they dealt with the locals who objected to being ruled by the French. Uh, French Indochina turned into a real hot spot in the 20th century. And the French uh, were finally defeated and driven out uh, at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Uh, and um, uh, the Americans took, uh, stepped in and took over as French Indochina became the Republic of Vietnam. And sex, 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 sex. Have I mentioned sex? If you lived in a proper Victorian household, uh, and, and, the, and, and if you've seen Victorian furniture, if you've seen, uh, seen pictures of Victorian dress, and you can look this up for yourself. Uh, like I said, they're buttoned head to toe and all that kind of good stuff. If, you're, uh, uh, if a man puts on a shirt, he, his, uh, uh, when he buttons it, 
he but the the shirt folds over from left to right, and he puts uh, and he buttons his button so that uh, uh, oh, and a woman's shirt uh, or blouse will button will fold over from right to left, uh, and so it will button up opposite. But this way, if I'm walking with my lady on my left arm, I can't be peeping in her shirt, and she can't be peeping in mine. Proper, huh? I, I, I don't see someone in, in, in a restaurant or a bar or in a park or something like that and walk up to her and introduce myself or, try, or start a conversation. I'd be considered a masher. Actually, they had laws. You could go to jail for doing that. Uh, if I was going to speak to a lady, I needed to have a proper introduction and most of the time a chaperone, uh, not, uh, not to be alone uh, together. Uh, the uh, Victorian furniture uh, sofas and chairs very often have skirts around the bottom of the sofa or the chair uh, so that you couldn't see the couldn't see the legs of it because if I could see the legs of a table there's no telling I might start thinking girl leg and, and follow that to its natural conclusion and get all hot and bothered about it uh, so uh, it, it, it was all about repressing uh, human sexuality, but uh, uh, and, and even though uh, the society demands that we behave one way in public, prostitution in Vienna, where Freud lived, was rampant, uh, and uh, so was venereal disease, for that matter. Um, uh, William Blake wrote... Uh, uh, the uh, the English poet wrote one of his uh, uh, more famous poems called uh, London, uh, and he talks about you know uh, wandering through chartered streets where the chartered Thames does flow, and every stranger's face I meet signs of weakness, signs of woe, and he concludes his um, uh, his poem, uh, but most through. Uh, Empty streets, I hear uh, how the youthful harlots cursed, uh, blights the newborn infant's near, and uh, blasts the newborn newborn infant's tear, and uh, blights with plague the marriage hearse. And he's talking about syphilis and syphilis, congenital syphilis, causing blindness uh, in newborns and what have you. Uh, and uh, so. People were aware that this was going on, but they chose to ignore it. And some folks were really, uh, uh, you know, militant about wanting to do things to to to, uh, uh, to to repress sexuality, to keep people from uh, uh, doing things that are driven by what they called the baser instincts at that time. Uh, this led uh, Dr. Kellogg, uh, a physician in the United States, to experiment with breakfast foods uh, to try to create a healthy yet bland diet for people but it, because it was believed that if you had a lot of spices in your diet, that caused your libido to act up. In other words, you, if you, the more spicy food you ate, the hornier you were. Uh, and look at Latin America. They eat a lot of peppers and they have big families, right? So let's try to uh, eliminate this in America. Kellogg's cornflakes was a dietary experiment to keep you uh, from becoming sexually aroused. Uh, so was Dr. Graham's crackers uh, also to keep you from becoming sexually aroused. And there were lots of efforts on this part. Uh, Meanwhile, if you went to a Victorian house, you saw skirts on the, on the furniture, you looked at the bookshelves, you did not see uh, uh, men and women authors sitting side by side on the bookshelf unless they were married, like Robert and Elizabeth Browning or something. Um, I don't know, you know, it was scandalous. I don't know, they might, maybe they thought they'd wake up with illegal pamphlets or, you know, something like that in the morning, illegitimate pamphlets. But uh, it just wasn't done. So uh, Freud 
concentrates a lot on sex and sexual drives and impulses and stuff in his discussion of what makes people people. Was he a dirty-minded old man? Uh, he was thinking this way when he was younger. <laughs> you know? uh, so, um, uh, and, and a lot of what he says is valid. Uh, and psych his psychosexual uh, theories have a lot of validity to them as well. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, in, ad in addition to, be, to being a hypocritically conflicted, sexual, eaten up with sexual awareness society, the Victorians uh, were also living in a world where you saw, as mentioned earlier, the American Civil War, uh, the Franco-Prussian War, the age of imperialism, the white man's burden, uh, you know, if, uh, this is, and what you're seeing is a, a technologically superior uh, cultures having their way with technologically inferior uh, cultures. And this is the way of the world, ladies and gentlemen. It's a bad way of the world, but it's the way of the world anyway. Uh, that's why I don't think that any spaceship that lands here and comes down to a visit us is coming in peace, <laughs> you know, is, uh, if, if, if they're superior to us technologically, it's probably going to be bad news for us, right? Uh, Victorian society was terribly conflicted, not just sexually, but, uh, but in other ways, too. Uh, you had uh, people in the Victorian era who, uh, uh, they're, who uh, uh, basically imposed um, discriminatory practices on people, say, of uh, uh, different sexes and different religions and things like that. Women uh, were just coming out of the Victorian era into the modern era in the United States of America when the 19th Amendment was passed that gave them the right to vote. Uh, uh, you know, that was just a couple of years before my mother was born, and her mother did not have the right to vote. My grandmother did not have the right to vote until uh, that legislation was passed. And uh, the uh, uh, so it, it was divided. And, and you had to be, you know, when you look back at the good old days, you have to be careful what you wish for. In Victorian society, at the tur in turn of the century America, women uh, were property. Uh, they belonged to their father, and then they belonged to their husband. Uh, and uh, there was a transfer of property when marriage occurred. Uh, the, uh, the divorce rate wasn't near high enough back then, by the way. <laughs> You know, the uh, uh, women had to put up with a lot. They couldn't work outside the home. If you divorced your husband, there, there wasn't no going to court to see who got what. I mean, he owned everything. Uh, you didn't uh, have a hearing to see who got custody of the children. They were his children, you know. If he let you leave with the clothes on your back, uh, if he let you pack a suitcase, he was a hell of a nice guy, you know. Uh, because you and everything you own, he owned. Um, people, Catholics, Jews, uh, uh, you know, people of other religion, Muslim, Muslims, uh, were routinely discriminated upon. Sigmund Freud was a brilliant man, uh, and he was a bold writer. He confessed to a lot of stuff. If you read Freud, he talks about basically his own experiences a lot and what it means. Uh, and he's taking some real risk with self-disclosure there. But Jews in Vienna, no matter how smart they were, no matter how educated and accomplished and charitable and wonderful and could walk on water, uh, they were... Uh, there were places they couldn't eat. Jews can't come into this restaurant. Jews can't uh, uh, be members of this club. Jews cannot be buried in this cemetery. Jews cannot go to this school. Jews cannot rise above this level of, uh, 
of employment and, and with a career. Uh, so uh, the glass ceiling for Jews was every bit as solid as the glass ceiling for women in that particular society. So it's, it, it's not surprising that uh, Freud came up with his ideas of, of, uh, of the personality being developed through internal and external conflicts, that uh, the, the struggles that we have. And he believed that a whole lot of what goes on with people that, uh, um, well, we forget sometimes that we're animals. And like any other animals, we have instincts and biological drives, and they overrule our thinking all the time. Uh, and so we have uh, instinctual things that are going on with us that, uh, uh, you know, override our consciousness and override our thought. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, they're more powerful uh, than our intentions. And there are two uh, instincts primarily that drive us. One is, our, uh, is eros, an erotic energy. And I don't mean that in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, seduction and sexuality. Erotic energy, eros, is a life drive. And we do life-affirming activities because of it. And, we, and we're pushed to do this. We, uh, uh, you know, we uh, engage in sexuality for recreation, certainly, and because we enjoy it or what have you, but also it's about procreation, about uh, having children, bringing uh, families into the world, raising families, taking care of our kids, contributing to the gene pool, more or less, but also about connection, uh, being friends, having uh, having relationships with people, you know, uh, creativity, life-affirming things, the things we do with our jobs, wanting to make a, 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 the world a different place, wanting to contribute to the world, leave a mark so that people know we were here. Uh, all of that is part of the erotic energy. But we also have a death drive, a death instinct, and that's Thanatos. Uh, and Thanatos also drives us uh, very hard, and it's a death drive, sometimes a death wish. We, uh, you know, we don't care whether we survive or not. When our aggressiveness levels are at a certain level, uh, we want to take out whoever the focus of this aggressive energy is, and sometimes that focus is on ourselves, so that we have anger, uh, the self-directed depression, uh, uh, urges towards self-slaughter, to doing ourselves harm, violence. Other times it's down the torpedoes full speed ahead and we've got an ob object out there. And this is a ladder theory and uh, psychoanalysis, Mayer's object relations stuff. Uh, and uh, I either uh, direct a lot of erotic energy toward that object out there and want to be creative and life affirming with it, or I can, uh, you know, uh, address a lot of um, the death uh, drive energy, the, the, the NATO energy out there to it. And uh, when I'm in that place, I, uh, I'm a nuclear bomb. <laughs> I take out everything. And if I don't survive it, so be it. Those, inst those conflicting instincts uh, led Freud to come up with this idea of a tripartite theory of personality. And uh, you can see that here with poor Homer. Uh, he knows there's only one donut left, and he wants that last donut. But uh, uh, the, the angel's telling him on his shoulder, uh, you know, you can't eat that donut, Homer, that, uh, you know, uh, that was saved for Marge or, you know, Bard or uh, whomever. Uh, and the devil on his shoulder, the shoulders telling gone, you want to. If they wanted it, they'd have eaten it. It's their fault. <laughs> you know, they shouldn't have left it there. Uh, and uh, Homer is in the middle, left trying to decide which of these conflicting uh, paths that he's, that he's going to take. 
in, in our lives, particularly in our moral lives with uh, our own private uh, ideas of ethics, uh, we walk down that path uh, where we uh, have these two conflicting drives and we are in the middle and have to uh, decide which way we're going. Uh, if you look at this, this is the id. It's blind, instinctive, demanding, wants what it wants when it wants it, don't care about other people. Oh, here's the superego. It's full of uh, uh, injunctions and interjections from the people around us, our parents, our teachers, our church, uh, our preachers and stuff like that that gives us an idea of what's right and wrong and morality and stuff like that. And over here, uh, we have uh, the ego uh, that's stuck in the middle, operating on the reality principle and having to balance between these two opposing forces and come up uh, with something that doesn't get us killed or punished or in, you know, in a lot of trouble otherwise. Uh, so, uh, and whichever uh, has the most psychic energy at the time to overwhelm the other is what we do. So we're the amazing three-in-one person. Uh, and uh, the uh, devil, as I said, is blind, instinctive, demanding. Uh, the angels, the super ego, the moral component. And the ego, uh, also called the ish, uh, what Freud called it, he was German. The, the I, the me, that's caught in the middle and uh, mediating between. Now these two forces, these two opposite forces on our shoulders uh, will kill us. They will absolutely, oops, I went too far. They will absolutely destroy us if they were left to themselves. And the ego knows that. Uh, so I'm driving down the road, armed, and someone cuts me off in traffic. You know, they could have made me have a wreck. They could have, uh, you know, uh, put my life at risk. They could have got me hurt, you know, and they had no right to do that. They didn't signal. They just cut over in front of me. I had to hit my brakes. Uh, I heard my groceries falling out of the back seat and into the floorboard, and now I'm pissed off. Uh, so why don't I just take my gun out and pull up next to them and shoot them in the head? Uh, you know, they richly deserve it, do they not? Uh, for pulling over in front of me like that and causing me to stand on my brakes. Like I said, they could have could have caused me to have an accident. They richly deserve it, and I really want to do it. You know, I want to pull up next to them and bust a couple of caps in them. But you know what? I have that ego, that me, the I that's in there caught in the middle. I, my angel hadn't showed up yet to tell me, oh, you, you can't do that. Forgive people. You know, that's your closest, uh, uh, that, that's the closest you'll ever get to divinity, Howard, is to forgive someone who's uh, intentionally done a bad thing to you, isn't it? Yeah, I want to tell my angel, shut up or I'll shoot him too. Uh, but uh, I can't, I, 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 a reasonable part says no matter what I want to do, if I do a road rage thing, uh, there's going to be trouble, you know, and I may be hurting a whole bunch of other people besides that guy that's the driver. Uh, it is not my decision to make to, uh, uh, to take, it is my decision to make to take that kind of an action, but is it a right decision if I decide to do something to them? Uh, and will there be consequences to that decision? And we think that way all the time. You know, we stop and think, can I do this? What will be the repercussions? What consequences will I pay? Uh, and for Freud, if you have a, a, a strong ego, then you're going to be able to get away uh, with things in society. But if you let these two things drive you, they'll drive you right over a cliff, man. Uh, and uh, next thing you know, you're going to be in jail or crucified. You know, uh, the uh, Ernest Hemingway once said uh, that if, uh, if you're too good, if you're too honest, if you're too brave, the world will kill you. Uh, and then he amended it to say 
the world will kill you anyway, but it'll do it faster if you're too honest, too true, and too brave. Uh, and there may be some truth to that. Freud came up with ego defense mechanisms, and these are self defenses on the psychic plane. Uh, a lot of the things that that may come to us from our unconscious, we don't know where they come from. We're going to talk about the unconscious here in a, in, in a little bit. Uh, and unconscious uh, uh, drives cause us to have impulses and desires and uh, things like that. We may feel them moment to moment going through the day when we're waking, and we may deal with them at night when we're asleep in dreams, when these unconscious desires and uh, impulses are dealt with symbolically. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, these are things that scare us for one reason or another. Uh, our desires might uh, scare us. Maybe we're sexually attracted to someone that we shouldn't be sexually attracted to, uh, you know. Uh, maybe uh, we want to do something that we know good and well that we shouldn't be doing because it violates our own moral codes or what have you. Uh, maybe there are memories that I'm uh, thinking about that I'm remembering that are so unsettling to me that they cause terrific emotional responses on my uh, side. I've seen something, I've done something, I've experienced something, and it scares me. I repress it. Repression, and you can find this in your in, in your book. It's um, um, oh my goodness, I think somewhere in a. 65 page range, something like that. Ah, 64, 62, 61, 61, I got it. Uh, and uh, anyway, so uh, ego defense mechanisms, that's what these are, uh, protect my sense of self, who I am, uh, how I see me, who I think I am. What's this have to do with alcoholism and drug dependence, Howard? Well, it has a lot. Uh, you don't see a lot of uh, Freudian psychology used in the treatment of alcohol and substance use. Uh, uh, but Father Martin talked about uh, being a three-in-one person, and that's what we're talking about here with tripartite personality and our instincts. Uh, and self identification, the, the way I see me, who the way I consider myself to be is probably the most important identity on the world uh, uh, for me, but it's, it's, it's not the only uh, perception. I am who I think I am, who I say I am, uh, and that's not entirely precise, it's not entirely on target. I am who you think I am. And that's only like another 100 to, you know, 2,074 uh, miles off uh, from who I really am. And then I am who I really am. And neither one of us knows that because of this sort of thing. Uh, I repress reality that I don't want to acknowledge. I deny uh, that problems exist. I deny that I feel certain things, for instance. I don't get angry. I'm a mellow guy. I, I never get jealous. I'm not a lustful person. You, you know, fill in the blank of the seven deadlies and then deny one to seven. You know, people do it every day. Uh, and uh, we fool ourselves that way, too. Then there's reaction formation. is expressing the opposite of things that uh, that scare us. So, for Freud, going back to his sexual thing, if I may be a person who is attracted to members of the same sex, but I don't want to admit that because that's bad news and I could be held up for ridicule and people would make fun of me and my mother wouldn't like it and all this kind of crap. Uh, so, um, I become a womanizer, and so that you can look and say, boy, that 
Howard, he has a, you know, he's always out with different women. He's got a very, you know, a virtual harem over here. Uh, and uh, maybe you'll see that by my, uh, the notches on my bedpost that I'm a real gunslinger as far as the opposite sex is concerned. Uh, that's a reaction formation. I also had a psychoanalyst tell me one time, if your reaction formation is strong enough, don't mess with it. <laughs> you, know, you got your life arranged the way you want it. Uh, then there's projection, and that's taking something that I don't like about me and assigning responsibility for it uh, to the environment, particularly to someone else in the environment. Uh, and uh, we're going to run across some theorists here in another chapter or two who blow, blow uh, uh, that out of the water. Uh, displacement is an ego defense mechanism. I'm really, really angry at my boss or uh, something that happened at work or a cop stopped me and gave me a ticket on the way home. I've been mangled by the powers that be in my life, and there's not a damn thing I can do about it, because if I pop wise, I'll get fired. If I pop wise, I'll get arrested. I can't do anything about it but sit there and grip my teeth and take it. Uh, and I go home fuming, and when I get home, I holler at the kids, shout at the wife, kick the dog, uh, and they had nothing to do with it. I'm just shifting my anger from a risky target that can cause me grief to a non-risky target that uh, I can abuse with impunity. Rationalization, I love this one. Uh, it, you know, in my early uh, academic career, uh, I... Uh, I, I'm an English major, I <laughs> majored in English literature, but uh, I've read a lot of different types of literature and world literature, and some of my favorite stuff's fables. I like Aesop's fables. And the fables serve as proverbs to instruct and, you know, inform and all that kind of good stuff. But my uh, about my uh, the one day a fox was walking uh, through a vineyard and it was a hot day and he was all sweaty and panting and you know couldn't take his fur coat off and as he goes through uh, uh, as he's going through there he sees a fat bunch of grapes hanging off a trellis and they just look delicious to him and he thinks well I'll get those grapes and that'll be well you know and I'll I'll that would be wonderful. I'll have some gripes. Um, and uh, he's unfortunately, he's too short, and he can't reach them. And he jumps, and he jumps, and he jumps, and he jumps until he's worn out. And then he gives up. And as he walks off, he looks back over his shoulder at the grapes and basically says to hell with it. They were sour anyway, which is where we get the expression sour grapes, right? And a rationalization is offering a good reason or a reason. It doesn't necessarily have to be a good one, uh, but I'll offer a reason, an explanation for why I couldn't do something or why I didn't do something or why I did something. You know, uh, I'll explain away uh, disappointments and failures and things like that by offering a reason that I hope other people will buy. Uh, but a good reason is not always the real reason, is it? And that's how it becomes a rationalization. Uh, sublimation. I really like punching people in the head. Uh, but, you know, all through school and on into my adolescence, if I punch people in the head, I get in trouble for it. Then I hear about uh, boxing, and so I go and get into boxing and become a mixed martial artist and things like that. Now I can beat the living hell out of people and sometimes hurt them really bad. And not only uh, will I get away with it, I'll get rewarded for it. You know, I have sublimated my thanatos into something that's more socially acceptable, uh, and I can do things that way. Isn't that cool? 
Uh, then there's regression. Uh, and kids do this. You can see this. Uh, you can see this a lot with kids. Uh, you know, you got you, you got your little school age jewel uh, there, who's first grade or so, uh, and gets a new little brother or sister. And all of a sudden, parents are coochie cooing the new little brother or sister, and suddenly uh, the the first grader is baby talking again, uh, sucking their thumb. Uh, wet in the bed, uh, you know, doing things that are infantile and moving backwards uh, to a period in their life where they were secure with their parents and with their role in the family and all of that good stuff. This happens when they go to school sometimes, too. Um, it's, it's not anything to really get upset about, just be patient with, but uh, we regress. Billy Bob uh, put this in the substance use terms. Billy Bob was down at uh, uh, the local water and hole, his local bar, and uh, the waitress cut him off. She said, that's enough, Billy Bob. You've had enough. You've drunk. You've had too much to drink, and I'm not serving you anymore. Now Billy Bob shouts at her, cusses her, threatens her, uh, gets into it with other patrons at the bar, turns over his uh, bottles at the table, has a temper hissy. Now, he's 45 years old and, got you know, got the 10-gallon hat and a 40-gallon gut uh, and, uh, you know, just having a meltdown right there in the uh, middle of a place uh, in order to get his way. That's regression, too. He's going back to something that used to work for him. If you throw a tantrum... Uh, people will uh, give in to you, especially if it was in uh, aisle four at Kmart, you know, or something like that. We don't have Kmarts anymore. I was kind of lost to the culture. Uh, you know, it's where people used to take their kids to work them over. <laughs> you better straighten up, kid, or I'm taking you to Kmart. Uh, then there's interjection. Uh, interjection is something that we do uh, uh, as we, as a shortcut to critical thinking and uh, as a means of avoiding conflict with other people. So that if uh, uh, I'm uh, sitting around with a bunch of folks who are expressing an opinion uh, and everybody in the room is expressing that opinion, I'm real loath to say anything opposite, even if that's what I believe. I am particularly, if I'm the new person in the group, I am more likely to accept what they are saying to in, uh, as an interjection. I just swallow it, uh, and, it and it's easier than thinking about it to see if it fits who I am, and it tends to further my acceptance by uh, the group that I'm in. Similar to interjection is identification. Uh, as I'm creating my own identity, my own idea of who I am, uh, then I want to stick with winners, so to speak. Uh, as a slogan from Palmer Drug Abuse Program, by the way, we found it necessary to stick with winners in order to grow. Uh, so I have uh, uh, the proper job with the proper uh, retirement plan with the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the house in the suburbs, the Volvo station wagon, the 3.2 kids, you know, whatever. Uh, and I basically say unto the world, look at me, I made it. I'm doing, I'm doing what, uh, uh, what I'm supposed to do. I'm successful. I'm, uh, and, I, uh, and I identify myself with groups by other activities. You're a Baptist because you believe what Baptists believe and you do what Baptists do. You're a Catholic for the same reason, or a Jew. You're a Republican because you believe what Republicans believe and you do what Republicans do and you say what Republicans say. And the same if you're a Democrat or a communist or a fascist or a Nazi or, you know, whatever. Uh, and we, uh, sometimes other people are laying those identifications on us and we accept them. Sometimes we're self-identifying, and we accept that, too. Uh, so uh, that's the way 
of uh, getting people to say, you know, see me for this. Don't see me for other things. See me for this. Uh, and uh, then compensation. Uh, compensation occurs when I feel like I have some uh, weakness, some flaw, some, uh, some something that I need to make up for. Uh, so uh, often you take people who are really driven to be successful and to do things in life, when you get right down to it, uh, they're compensating for uh, lacks that they have. They're compensating for things that they perceive as weaknesses in their lives or deficiencies. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that drives us to want to make up uh, for this. Complex, huh? The, the book is a little more uh, uh, explanatory. It's a little more in depth, so you can you know go in there and read it. You're supposed to have done that anyway. Uh, the Freudian psychosexual stages. Now, here's where it gets interesting: uh, that uh, you go through these stages for Sigmund Freud uh, from. Uh, uh, and, and these stages actually take you from your, the first year of your life to, to the 18th year of your life. That's when you're doing your developing. Uh, and after the age of 18, the genital stage just goes on for the rest of your life, right? Uh, but the oral uh, stage of life is the first year of life. Human babies are helpless things. Uh, if you don't take care of them, they die. And they can't feed themselves. They can't change themselves. They can't cover themselves up. They can't go out and get a job. You know? uh, they have to be, they're totally reliant on caregivers. Uh, and if the baby uh, can, uh, is, their needs are met and taken care of, uh, you know, then they're, um, um, they learn to trust other people. Eric Erickson, we'll talk about him in a minute, uh, uh, talked about, uh, agreed with Freud on this, that the first year of life is trust versus mistrust. You can rely on people or not rely on people. And, uh, uh, you know, babies are a lot of fun. Uh, you know, peekaboo with the baby when you hide and then come back and the baby's delighted because you disappeared and then you reappeared. Uh, and their little concrete experiences of the world, if you duck behind the sofa and they can't see you, you are not. In other words, you don't exist. If you're outside of their vision, you, you are not uh, because you're, and you're an extension of them. Uh, and when you pop back up, it's a miracle. <laughs> You know, and they're delighted by it. Uh, wow, wouldn't it be great if you could uh, continue to keep kids as entertained and engaged with you, you know, as they get into their teens? But anyway, uh, anal uh, stage begins. Oh, and oral, by the way, is when the babies, uh, uh, everything that they relate to is oral. They're breastfeeding, you know, that kind of thing. It's a it's a, it's, a, it's a way of bonding with mom and uh, of uh, comforting themselves. Uh, and uh, for Freud, uh, breastfeeding period, that first year of life is fraught with danger. You know, uh, if mom uh, resents it, if she is angry with you uh, because you want to eat, that kind of thing, uh, it can scar you for life. If uh, uh, you know, she takes you off the breast too quickly. Uh, you can have issues. If she leaves you on there until you're 18, you know, you can have issues. And yes, it's pretty true that as far as uh, messing uh, uh, up individuals, uh, is mom's fault in Freudian uh, psychiatry. The anal stage of development is age one to three. And that's where you're learning to deal with frustration and express anger and stuff like that and exert control over your environment. And uh, you can make adults crazy by either uh, releasing uh, 
uh, feces or urine or withholding it till they get the diaper on you and then releasing it. You make you can make adults, uh, you know, sing and dance at that stage by doing that. It can be entertaining. Uh, and of course, you know, the way the adults respond to you is going to have a, a great deal to do with the way you develop from that point. Um, I can't remember the name of the movie. I watch too many movies to be trusted on that, I guess. But it had um, it had uh, Danny DeVito in it. He was a civilian contractor working uh, for the uh, for the military, uh, and uh, uh, one of the he was working with some ne'er do well soldiers, trying to uh, tutor them so that they could uh, pass some test to move up in rank or whatever. And uh, they were low functioning. And uh, anyway, uh, he got sideways with a drill sergeant because the drill sergeant was chewing out uh, one of his students. And he went up to the grill, drill sergeant and he said, Ma'am, won't you lighten up a little bit? He said, He's just a kid. <laughs> you know, uh, he, he goofed up. And the drill sergeant called him off the side and went off on him, you know, telling him, yeah, You know, don't you ever do that to me when I'm dressing down one of my troops and yada, yada, yada. And as Danny DeVito walked away, he went, sheesh. He said, uh, talk about anal. This guy must have been potty trained at gunpoint. <laughs> you know? uh, and uh, so he makes a quick uh, de de decision about that. If uh, you do not get through this stage, uh, Normally, you'll become fixated there and you'll become a bit of a control freak or you won't have any control at all, which is uh, uh, just as bad. Uh, this is, uh, you know, you have an aunt like this or a mom. She gets up in the morning and everything's in the way it's supposed to be and she looks at her hair in the mirror and says, part, and it does. Uh, then, you know, control freak. Uh, you can be oral aggressive, oral incorporated, anal retentive, uh, you know, all of these fixations that can come out of, uh, uh, and fixations are stuck points where you haven't moved normally through this stage of development and you're, you're stuck there. <clears throat> Phallics, age three to six. Uh, kids are sexual. Y'all know that, right? They like to do things. They like to play doctor, they look, like to look at each other's equipment, sometimes even touch it and stuff like that. Uh, and they like to touch themselves, you know. Throckmorton has just learned that he's got a willy and he's running through the house waving it like a lasso, yeehaw. Uh, and we tell him things like, stop that, you'll grow hair in the palm of your hands, that'll make you insane, you'll need glasses because you'll go blind. And I think most of the people who told me that in my life were wearing glasses, so they probably knew something about what they were talking about. But, uh, it, you know, human sexuality begins to emerge fairly early with us, and it's, um, you know, an awareness of our bodies, an awareness of differences. Freud has a lot to say about this. Electro complexes, Oedipus complexes, penis envy, and that kind of thing uh, that happens with little girls. Uh, the uh, uh, So uh, there's a good deal of truth to this. And the, the way that uh, our caretakers deal with us when we become sexually aware, become aware uh, of things like masturbation feels good. Touching yourself feels good. Uh, uh, it, the, the, the way that uh, adults come down on us, uh, the way that adults address that or whether they come down on us, uh, has a lot to do about whether we have uh, uh, build a lot of shame around uh, sexuality and physicality and our bodies and things like that. Uh, and this, this starts preschool, really. Uh, Freud believed in a very large sense that by the, time you're, by the time you enter school, which is around the age of six, 
your personality, you are who you're going to be for the rest of your life. Your personality is pretty well set, you know, uh, and uh, it will, you know, it will mature with you, but the tendencies that you have will remain the tendencies that, uh, uh, the, uh, including the way you react to people, the way you present yourself, the way you believe, your emotional responses, etc., and so forth. It doesn't, uh, you know, uh, as we mature, we learn to get a handle on them and uh, who we can express what with and things like that. But our personality is fairly set. Then we go into latency, age 6 to 12, and we get into, uh, uh, you know, making friends and all of that kind of good stuff and activities, playing uh, becomes important to us and... and uh, uh, what our friends are doing and uh, how we're doing and we want to be involved, you know, in, in gymnastics or get into a little league and stuff like that. Uh, and that takes a lot of our energy away and we're moving away from family identity towards peer group identity and moving into uh, uh, who am I going to be. And, my, uh, and then uh, uh, around 12, <clears throat> the genital stage emerges, and this is, has to do with identity too. I'm uh, uh, making determinations around my sexuality. I think Freud, if we could put him in Bill and Ted's excellent phone booth and, and, and bring him back here to, uh, to talk to us today, he might say, well, you know, uh, sexuality is instinctual too. Right. People don't choose that. What they choose is whether they're going to acknowledge it or not. But by the time you're 12 years old or so, you probably already got an idea, uh, and maybe even way before that, of whether uh, of how you're going to be oriented. It's uh, <coughs> in terms of sexuality, whether you're going to be hetero or homosexual or omnisexual or metrosexual or whatever you want to call it. Uh, you're uh, bisexual. You'll you'll have an idea. You'll be a you'll have a gender identity already uh, for yourself, and you won't have sat down and thought about it. It's not like people. I, I you know I've never known anyone actually who sat down and thought, uh, hmm, why I should be gay? Why I should be straight? And made a list, right? And there probably are people out there who have, but I I don't I don't know them. <clears throat> I uh, go to a football game and uh, I'm watching football and I like football and everything's great. Uh, and then the dancers come on and I go, hmm, boy, look at those dancers over there. Look at those cheerleaders. Uh, and my friend Z sat next to me and uh, he's oriented differently. And he's, uh, hmm, look at those linebackers, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's not a choice that anyone makes, it just is. What we do with our sexuality and how we express it can bring us condemnation sometimes. It can bring us condemnation from society, it can bring us condemnation from uh, the people we're close to, from our families, etc. And I have seen people who are totally, uh, you know, uh, driven out of uh, their family systems because of their sexuality. Uh, and then uh, remember those uh, uh, remember those uh, uh, ego defense mechanisms we were talking about? The ego defense mechanisms can turn on you too. Uh, uh, one client of mine that uh, I uh, had some years back, actually before I ever got to Lee College, I think, so it was a long time ago, uh, he was a very religious guy, uh, and he was what we might, uh, you know, today call an evangelical or a fundamentalist. And uh, he had very strict beliefs, and one of his beliefs was that homosexuality is a sin, and that uh, to be a homosexual is to rebel against God and to put your eternal soul at risk and all of that good stuff. Uh, but he was gay. And boy, did he struggle with that. And he was not, uh, I'm not talking about an old man. This guy was on the sunny side of 20. Uh, and, uh, you know, he believed that he was an abomination and going to hell and all of that kind of good stuff. 
because he also believed in a religion. <coughs> Baptist, <coughs> I'm a, I was raised in a Baptist church. We commit thought crime to look at somebody with lust is, is, uh, is just like doing it, you know. So even thinking about it, even uh, entertaining that thought's enough to get you condemned, and that's what he was doing. He had a real tough time reconciling his sexuality with his faith. I don't know if he ever did. Eric Erickson, ein Deutscher, who came to live to a, uh, came to America and lived here for the rest of his life, was not very much formally educated, although he made a big splash in, psych in the world of psychology and was an instructor and at, uh, I think it was at Berkeley in California for a long time. Maybe it was UCLA. Anyway, uh, Erickson was a social uh, psychologist, and he came up uh, with psycho... Uh, ooh, I just noticed that I have an error on this. This is not psychosexual stages. These are psychosocial uh, stages. They do align, however, with Freud's... Uh, uh, psychosexual stages up to adolescence. At the end of adolescence, he departs. Freud just kind of gave up on you after you hit the age of 18 and said, well, you know, there you are, you're in the genital stage, and that's where we stay till we die. Uh, Ericksonian psychosocial stages uh, are, they don't negate Freud psychosexual developmental stages. They just say there's more to it than this. Uh, for Erickson, as a psychosocial psychologist, said that, uh, uh, you know, uh, human beings were herd animals, and you can't just look at us as individuals and understand what's going on because there's so many social forces out there. And Freud said, I know that. You know, that's, that's why I said, you know, mom's involved in this and, and care, care, caregivers and stuff. Uh, but Erickson takes it a little further. Uh, the infancy... A period of time uh, is trust versus mistrust, you know, learning to rely on mom. Uh, I, when I'm a baby and when I'm a child, and you know this too because it's happened to you, uh, you don't look in a mirror and see yourself. You don't have an idea when you get up in the morning, uh, you know, sitting there in your and you're in, in your nappy waiting, you know, which is soiled, waiting to get changed, that this is who I am forever. <laughs> you know, this is what I'm, this is it. This is it. this is all I can ever hope for. Uh, and it's all my fault. And, uh, you know, none of that. You rely on other people to care for you. If they do care for you and they're reliable, then you begin to trust that your needs are going to be met. And that's going to be important as you move forward. Because meeting your needs, uh, getting your needs met is how to learn to meet other people's needs. And some people, unfortunately, have a hard time with that. Uh, so uh, there's a socialization aspect to that. Mom loves me. I know that. She doesn't have to tell me that because she's showing me that. She is loving me. It is an act. She takes care of me. She bathes me. She feeds me. She talks to me. She cuddles me. She does all this wonderful stuff. If I don't get that, then I'm deprived. It makes it harder for me to fit in with other people as I, as I grow up. In early childhood, uh, the, of ages uh, uh, one to three, then uh, I, I, I have another uh, uh, learning process going on that uh, um, uh, is autonomy uh, uh, versus uh, shame and doubt. So that you know, if you're parents, you know, uh, that uh, sometime around this stage, and a little later too, kids like to do stuff. They like to feed themselves. They watch what you're doing. They'll pick up the uh, remote control so that they can exert a little control over what we're watching on TV, or they'll want to play with your phone, or uh, they'll want to dress themselves or feed themselves or 
fix their own meal or, you know, whatever it is that they're trying to do. Kids are supposed to do that. They're exploring their world. They're learning things about it and learning things about themselves at the same time. Uh, and uh, uh, whether we, uh, and we can get messages at that time that can cripple this. Stop that. You can't. You can't do that. You're not big enough. You're not strong enough. You're not smart enough. What in the hell's wrong with you, you little son of a bitch? You know, uh, idiot. You think you can, you know, do that and then boom. Uh, when people, when you're getting those types of messages, then you're seeing yourself in a different light. To complete the analogy, I began in infancy. We don't see ourselves except through other people's eyes at that age. I don't see me. I'm not making judgments about who I am. I'm listening to what people are telling me that I am. I'm seeing the way they respond to me, and I'm reading that. And I know how to read it. Uh, and so do you. And so does every child. Uh, then we get to the, uh, you know, the preschool age. Uh, we continue... Uh, with initiative uh, versus guilt of being able to, uh, you know, initiate things, to start things, and uh, and stuff like that. Uh, adolescence uh, brings us uh, identity versus role confusion. We've again got our sexuality pretty set. Uh, not most people are not confused after that age, uh, and. Um, you know, we're looking to, uh, we're, we've got friends, we've identified ourselves, we know what kind of music we like to listen to. Our friends' opinions, by the way, though, during this particular uh, stage of uh, development is much more important to us than our, our parents, by the way. Uh, when I was uh, in my early teens, in my adolescence, and even up until the age of 18, maybe a little beyond, I was pretty sure that my father was probably the stupidest beast that ever walked up on hind legs, uh, you know, with the stuff that he was telling me and things like that. Uh, and I, I knew a lot better than he did. Of course, by the time I was 25 or so, he had smartened up considerably as I was in the walkabout adult world by that time, uh, starting a family of my own. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, all of this is a period of learning and of connection. My peers are very important to me in adolescence, and that's where, and as we move along in these addiction counseling classes and then the prevention classes, uh, that's one of the things that makes that age group at such risk. Uh, they're easy to sway. Their brains are not developed all the way yet, and they're very, very strung out on social considerations. Am I developing the way I'm supposed to develop? Is my voice deep enough? Do I have hair on my chest? Or in the case of ladies, you know, uh, are, are your breasts developing evenly? Is one larger than the other? Uh, and little girls, you can see them coming down the hallway, and it's like almost an instantaneous thing. Uh, one week they're all kneecaps and elbows and gangly as everything, and a week later they're gliding. <laughs> you know? uh, and they're practicing uh, uh, emotional relationships and interactions and things like that with their friends. So, um, uh, uh, so, uh, So they're practicing these interactions with one another uh, and uh, getting ready for their adult lives to have, um, to have uh, relationships as they get older. Um, my household's waking up. It's getting noisy in here, so I'm moving. The... Uh, The Ericksonian stages of development rely upon the idea that uh, you know that we're that we're not static, and that our interactions, our social interactions, uh, drive us every bit as much as biology does. 
middle age. Uh, uh, this is where, and this is an Ericksonian term too, this is where identity crisis happens a lot. We've made important decisions when we were younger uh, through our interactions with our parents and our friends about who we're going to be and how we're going to be. But somewhere in the middle of our life, we have uh, uh, become disenchanted with it. Uh, and it's not what I want it to be. It's not like I want it to be. I wish I could do something else. Uh, it's time to uh, trade my 40-year-old wife in for two, uh, uh, for two 20-year-olds. I want to get a tattoo. I want, a, I want a, a, a convertible car. I don't want to go to work at the insurance office anymore. I want to make candles and sell weed, you know? Uh, so uh, sometimes we have some real crisis there. And, um, and I want to do something. And I'm coming to some awarenesses about myself, too. Maybe I'm not going to... Uh, maybe I'm not going to... Uh, get to go to Hollywood and be a leading man, you know, uh, and 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 have a and have a nude scene with Madonna or something like that, you know. Maybe I'm not going to write the great American novel. Maybe I'm not going to be a success and have my own business and be a a, a wealthy cazillionaire. Maybe this nice cushy salary job's it. Uh, and uh, I also begin to have identity crisis around, is what I'm doing meaningful? Is anyone going to remember, is it going to matter? Does it matter at all? Is anyone going to remember me uh, when I'm gone? Is what I'm doing, does it, is it going to matter to anyone when I'm gone? And if the answers uh, to this, you know, is yes, then I'm pretty set. And when I get later life, which is 60 plus, and I'm that, uh, you know, uh, uh, or maybe my goal by now is to die with dignity, you know, and, uh, uh, and I'm comfortable with what I've done. And, um, and that uh, becomes, um, you know, an issue with the uh, Ericksonian psychosexual stages. So Freudian psychoanalytical theory, and uh, that's with his contemporaries as well and the people who came after him, uh, Harry Stack, Sullivan, Carrie Horney, Anna Freud, uh, you know, all those uh, folks. Uh, and we're about four or five generations beyond Freud now with, uh, you know, with Mailer and others. Uh, but Freudian psychoanalytical theory is largely deterministic. It's rooted in biological forces. It's instincts. It's driven by instincts. It's driven by biology. It's driven by things that we don't understand and can't control. We can't study it directly, so we study it indirectly. Uh, the goal is to make the unconscious conscious. Just take it to Harry Potter, right? Uh, new. No, it's not that mystical. As a matter of fact, there's a bit of pragmatism involved in it, uh, but it looks mystical. Uh, especially if you get into dreams, which are the royal road to the unconscious, right? Uh, Going back a few slides, remember when uh, w there was a discussion about dreams being um, uh, a way to deal with repressed desires and, uh, uh, you know, uh, things that uh, frighten us, we deal with it symbolically. And uh, the symbolism of dreams for Freud is twofold. Uh, one, of course, is that the dream means what the dream means. That's the manifest content. Uh, content. If you dream that you're driving a car down the side of a building somewhere, then that's you're driving a car down the side of a building. That's what your dream means, you know, and it's not possible to do that in real life, but you can do it in your dream. Uh, but... The manifest content doesn't tell the whole story. That's what's going on. That's what you're seeing, your images, your uh, uh, the little slideshow playing in your head. Uh, what's more important is the latent content of the, uh, of the dream, what it means, and that expresses your unconscious uh, desires. Working with uh, drug addicts, I don't spend a lot of time discussing dreams with them. I don't do dream analysis. 
uh, dream analysis is terrifically interesting, and there's all kinds of cool books you can get on it. You know, you can go to Amazon and get some Kindle copies really cheap uh, about how to interpret dreams. But, uh, uh, and uh, uh, some people assign a great deal of meaning to that and mysticism around dreams. And other people believe it's just randomly firing neurons and don't really mean a lot of anything. I, I, I'm in the middle. I think that, uh, you know, that uh, when you've got stress and things going on in your life, it's very often expressed in dreams. And with our clientele, we'll uh, have people who get sudden, uh, who in, as they're recovering, their dreams will become vivid uh, and frightening to them. And this is uh, not because they're going crazy. This is because that for years through their drug use, they've repressed REM sleep where dreams take place. And is uh, uh, their uh, dream life reactivates itself, then the dreams can become uh, uh, more specific, more vivid, etc. cetera. Um, but they are just dreams, and dreams generally aren't going to hurt you. Recurring dreams indicate something's going on. If you dream about the same thing over and over again, it's probably something that you need to talk about with someone. Uh, if you have slip dreams, don't worry so much about that. Uh, your drug use was important to you and you're giving it up. Uh, and it was a big part of your life, so you're going to be doing a little grieving. You may be handling that grieving uh, uh, while you're asleep and you may be uh, fantasizing. It's not really fantasizing because you're asleep and you don't have control over it. Uh, but your fears of getting high again uh, will express themselves there. So there, there is room to discuss dreams sometimes with people, but it's not a big focus of, uh, of the practice of substance abuse counseling. What Freud's theories gave us more than anything else is language, uh, uh, and you know, you uh, uh, you hear about uh, uh, particularly the ego defenses, uh, projection, denial. That's language that you hear all over the place in uh, uh, the treatment uh, uh, profession and in the treatment field. Uh, he gave us ages of development, and uh, every theorists that come along after Freud has either expanded upon Freud's ideas and built upon them, or they've come up with, uh, with uh, uh, theories that uh, arose in opposition to those theories. So win, lose, draw, like him, don't like him, whatever, Freud's important. So is Carl Gustav Jung. Uh, and Jung is uh, out of disfavor, he's in disfavor a lot, and one of the reasons he's in disfavor uh, is because um, uh, he comes from a family of mystics. They like to hold seances, you know, and bend spoons with their brains and amazing Crescent stuff, you know. Uh, and his sister uh, was a psychic, and uh, you know, to the and, and had a large clientele clientele, also Vietnamese, uh, v Viennese, who came to her uh, for readings and um, prognostications and what have you. Uh, Jung uh, concerned himself a lot with spirituality. He was a hell of a guy. Uh, uh, I, uh, I can't remember in which piece of literature it was, but uh, that I'd read where he had addressed a group of uh, uh, students uh, who were, uh, you know, studying psychiatry, psychology, getting ready to be psychiatrists. And his advice to them was work hard, apply yourselves, learn your theories as best as you can, and always be prepared to push them aside when you touch the miracle of human life. And that's really good advice. <laughs> you know? Uh, so uh, Jung, uh, he gave us a lot of things too, and we, you know, and I, it it would be uh, uh, irresponsible of me not to uh, give you an idea of his contributions. 
he talks about collective unconscious. Now, conscious and unconscious is very important for Freud. Uh, we do things in our conscious life. I mean, I'm awake when I do them, right? And I know what I'm doing, and I can tell myself a reason why I do them, although that reason's not always the real reason. Remember rationalization, uh, projection, those things. Why are we the way we are? Why do we do the things we do? Why are we afraid of the dark? You ever stop to think about that? It's not that, yeah, well, wait a minute, Bushard, I'm not afraid of the dark. I'm perfectly okay in the dark. You should be afraid of the dark. Uh, you can step in a gopher hole and break your leg. Then where would you be? Uh, you know, especially if you lived 200, 300 years ago, 400 years ago, 500 years ago. How are you going to run away from animals that are out to get you? How are you going to climb a tree? How are you going to get your food? How are you going to deal with uh, infection? Stuff like that. You better be afraid of the dark because you can't see well in there. We'll be walking uh, through, the, through the meadow and walk right down the throat of a tiger that we hadn't seen yet. and He's been watching us for 200 yards. Uh, that's why we're afraid of the dark. We can't see, and there's dangers in the dark, and we build lights in our houses so that we can see in the dark, and we build fires at the mouth of the cave so that things won't come in and eat us, and we huddle in there, and we tell each other stories, and we pray to our gods, whatever they may be, that we live till the sun's up again, right? Because that's our element. And then we take our... Uh, uh, take our spears and our slings and our clubs and we walk out in the daylight and all of those nighttime scaries, they're afraid of us because uh, the worms turned. Why at the beach am I having a swell time swimming, surfing, snorkeling, whatever, and all of a sudden I have the eeriest premonition, the coldest chill go up my spine, and I wish like hell that I was back on the shore and I look out to sea. Uh, water's not my element. It's not my element. Uh, there are all kinds of things in the water that if they were on land, I'd work them over. But in the water, I can't. They're in their element. Even a little tiny shark, about 18 inches long, worked me over in a horrid way, and I couldn't do a thing to stop him, you know, if he, if he wanted to do that. Uh, this is what, uh, uh, what Jung referred to as collective unconscious. When I was a little kid, uh, my grandmother took me to the zoo, and I, uh, you know, in the zoo, I saw lions and tigers and bears and uh, stuff like that, and you know, and monkeys, and uh, you know, they had brown eyes, and and they were fuzzy and furry, like my cat at home, you know, things like that. I might be moved to want to pet them. Then I saw a crocodile, and no one had to tell me anything about a crocodile. I looked at that cold reptile eye. I saw that mouthful of teeth. And I knew right away, this is bad news. <laughs> you know, no one had to say, don't get too close, Howard. Uh, you know, this is collective unconscious. And it, we build this, our fear of heights, our fear of the dark, you know, on our ancestors' experiences with it. And it's instinctual for us to, to, to have these fears. Uh, we're attracted to symbols. We look at things, you know. Uh, right now, in this best of all possible republics in an election year, people are getting all cheery and emotional over seeing flags waving out there, uh, the symbols of their political party. We get weepy and emotional over the trappings of our faith uh, when we see crosses and things like that. Symbols mean things to us. Mythologies mean things to us. Rituals mean things to us. And we invest of ourselves in these things. This is part of what Jung has, is bringing to the table. 
this collective unconscious has got a bunch of stuff in it that we that we can't even drag into our unconscious, much less into our uh, subconscious, preconscience, or conscience, uh, and it's it's hard to discern. And in the collective unconscious, we have ideas of things. We have ideas about how life's supposed to be. We have ideas about how we got here. We have ideas about what uh, God is like. We have idea about what demons are like. We, we insist on an afterlife because of our experiences in the collective unconsciousness, and we seek spiritual experiences because of that. So, uh, Jung's uh, uh, collective unconscious seems to uh, wants to explain this. Uh, here's you, or me, or the person next to you, or whomever, uh, and we have a personal unconscious. And this personal unconscious is our instincts and things. Many of this comes from there. Uh, so th this and these are all. Um, this is called a Venn diagram, by the way. These are the circles. Uh, and this diagram shows that there's an intersection among all of these. And the intersection with the collective, uh, the personal unconscious, and the ego is very small, uh, uh, where they all come together. But this one uh, informs, and this one informs a little more. Uh, this, by the way, is called the, uh, the pre-conscious or the subconscious. It's something is but is that nether world between the uh, personal unconscious and the ego. But uh, uh, how we move stuff from here to here to there where we can understand it, and if we don't understand it, there's not a damn thing we can do about it. You know, if you do not know what's bothering you, you, could, you cannot fix what's bothering you. If you, could not, uh, if you cannot name what the problem is, then you cannot formulate a plan uh, to address that problem. It just doesn't work that way. So, um, you move material, studying it indirectly, uh, from here to there to there to there. The hundredth monkey has to do with the collective unconscious. Now this is, I have never seen any empirical evidence of this, but I like the story. The story is, once upon a time, in the home islands of Japan, uh, there's a group of snow mon monkeys that lived on one of the islands. This is a snow monkey, by the way. Uh, and the snow monkeys would come down to the beach on their island and greet tourists who would come uh, to, to see them you know, on boats. And uh, the tourist would uh, buy sweet potatoes and throw them to the monkeys. And the monkeys uh, uh, would uh, perform antics and run around and get their sweet potatoes and eat them for the tourist and all this kind of good stuff. Uh, it doesn't sound terrifically entertaining, but if I were there, I'd go. Uh, and uh, when, when your sweet potato lands on a sandy beach... It presents some issues for you if you want to eat it, and you're going to eat it raw because snow monkeys don't have microwaves, right? <laughs> so, uh, what's this snow monkey going to do? Is it's going to try to brush the sand off of it, or maybe it eats, you know, and it's eating yam and spitting dirt and all this kind of stuff. Well, one day, a tourist threw a yam, and it didn't quite reach the shore, and it landed in the sea. Uh, snow monkeys aren't particularly afraid of water either, and this enterprising uh, young female uh, jumped right out there in the surf and uh, uh, splashed out and got her yam and uh, uh, took a bite of it. And she made a marvelous discovery, and her discovery was that not only was it not dirty, it was salty. Uh, so that she had a salty yam with no sand on it. What she learned after that was that any time she picked up a yam, whether it was in the water or on the beach, if it was on the beach, rather, uh, she would uh, wait out in the water and wash it off. And she taught her children 
uh, when they got their yams to go out there in the water and wash it off. Uh, and the other monkeys in the troop picked up on this idea and they began to take their yams out there into the surf and wash them off. And when a critical psychic load was reached at the 100th monkey, the 100th monkey on the island that learned how to do this, it was like uh, a spark, a psychic spark that happened, and every monkey on every island in the archipelago knew how to do it. It's like consciousness jumped. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, uh, but if you're talking about collective unconsciousness, you are talking about collect, uh, about genetic memory, and you are talking about instincts that are based on things that my ancestors learned uh, when they were still running around and building fires and hiding in the caves of Europe. They were painting things on their walls. They were inventing gods in their own images, and sometimes in other images too and creating symbols uh, that uh, made sense to them, right? Um, Y'all recognize any of these? Probably do. Lord Ganesh, or Ganesha, uh, the elephant god. Uh, Mark Twain said one time that compared to Hindus, uh, we are paupers when it comes to gods. We only have one to three <laughs> at any particular time in Western culture. Uh, but the Hindus have hundreds of them and worship them all. And this is Lord Ganesh, uh, who uh, is in the Hindu pantheon. Uh, uh, and of course, you know what these are. Uh, that's uh, uh uh, a representation of Golgotha, the place of the skull, where Christ and the two thieves were executed. Uh, and uh, this means something, something, especially to people who are of a Christian bent, who see something like Golgotha. Uh, because even though it was Christ and the two thieves on side to side, it's also the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost is the Trinity represented there, the three-in-one man, the three-in-one God, uh, you know, the id, the ego, the superego. Uh, all of these Trinity awarenesses are all shot through our cultures and our faith. But when we see that, that's a cross. But, you know, the cross was an important symbol in cultures that never heard of Jesus of Nazareth never heard of him, uh, and cultures that existed thousands and thousands of years before Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, and Jesus, of course, uh, is speaking particularly to, uh, to, uh, to Christians and to, Amer uh, and, and to Christian Americans too, right? <laughs> I, I've never quite got that because no one in the Bible ever heard of a place called the United States of America. It didn't exist. It was in a world that was beyond their kin. Uh, this is a, a symbol here. It's got yin and yang, uh, which are Chinese symbols in it. And it's got the swastikas in it, which are good luck, life wheel, uh, 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 symbols. And this is a symbol of a Chinese religious group called Falun Gong. And uh, they're very right wing. They're quite fascist, really, <laughs> in, uh, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, they're also publishers of the Epoch Times, if you're interested in that. Uh, the, the online news source is particularly uh, geared to white conservatives over the age of 60. Uh, this is an Ankh. It's uh, an Egyptian fertility uh, symbol uh, that the goddess Heroth might uh, carry, and Osiris and Isis. Uh, again, uh, the, the swastika. If you are a uh, aficionado of symbols, you may notice something about this swastika here and, and the Falun Gong uh, 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 swastika that's different from Hitler's swastika. Um, and might you hazard to guess what that is? Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Uh, 
the legs are going clock, uh, count, uh, counterclockwise instead of clockwise. Uh, Hitler would uh, his uh, brakes would be facing to the to the right rather than to the to the left, uh, but still a cross symbol. Uh, this is a Celtic cross. This is another uh, we call it a peace sign. Uh, and regardless what this Triskelion meant, and uh, which is what it really is. Uh, to uh, mystics of old, what it means to people in the 20th century is the peace sign. Uh, and it's what people wore, uh, you know, when they were protesting the war in Vietnam, and which uh, uh, people who uh, followed this might call the <laughs> footprints of the American chicken. Uh, the uh, Triskelion is also. Uh, the uh, the symbol of some white nationalist organizations uh, that uh, um, uh, use that particular symbol themselves, usually without the circle. Speaking of the circle, there it is. That's a Mandela. Circles are mythical time. And the, uh, a thing that you'll notice about a circle here, kiddos, is there's no beginning. There's no end. It just is. And it's forever and it's always. It doesn't start anywhere. It doesn't end anywhere. It just is. And inside the circle is mythical time. There's n no time passing. It just is. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, with this ring, I be wed, and I put it on your finger, uh, and it's about love, that there's no beginning and there's no end. And what kind of love is that? That's godly love. That's agape love. That's romantic love. That's the love of a man for a woman or, you know, whatever combination you stick up there. And that ring uh, is a symbol of eternity. This is eternal uh, time. This is eternal connection. What God hath put apart, uh, together, let no man put asunder. Uh, and it's a very powerful symbol for, for human beings. A circle means a lot to us, and whatever we put inside that circle becomes important to us. Uh, so uh, that rings a bell with us. It's also a, a thing of ownership. It's like a brand. So that when someone looks at your ring finger and there's that gold band on it, that means, <laughs> you know, no trespassing. Uh, it's, it's ownership. I gave, I gave her daddy 20 cows for this woman. Stay away. <laughs> you know? uh, so it's also about ownership. A uh, couple other things. Uh, Y'all know this guy? He's he's a god, believe it or not. His name's Coco Pelli. Uh, and Coco Pelli's the trickster god of the Hopis. Uh, and he's uh, he stooped over. In fact, Coco Pelli's hunchback, but he's got away with the women. The women love him. And he plays the flute for them, and he seduces them right and left. Uh, so... Um, Coco Pella, and he tricks them to do it. So he pulls the wool over people's eyes. He might be what uh, we would consider, uh, uh, if we're looking at Jungian archetypes, he'd be the trickster or the demon. Uh, Jung defied archetypes and said that uh, certain things appeal to our ideas of that. Uh, this, is, uh, this, this mask is called Dramatis, uh, Dramatis Personae. Uh, and it's the uh, drama personas uh, and uh, uh, tragedy and comedy married together, although tragedy and comedy really are the same thing. You know, people laugh and cry for the same reasons. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, symbols... Uh, are uh, terrifically important to man. And these are things that uh, Jung brought to it. He also brought 
uh, to the discussion ideas of personality types, extroverts, introverts, you know, thinkers, intuitors, that type of thing. He uh, uh, came up with the word association test. You know, where I say one thing and you say the first thing that pops into your mind. I say up, you say down, I say black, you say white, I say water, you say Evian. And I say, okay. I say green and you say uh, grass and I say gold and you say money and I say hat and you say hair and I say bridge and you say board game, card game. What I'm beginning to figure out as I'm doing this is you have fixations uh, around certain words that key an emotional response, in this case, water. Uh, and that water tells me that you've had some kind of traumatic event around that. And so I can use word associations and I can use ink blots, which is done by a guy named Rorschach, uh, to. Uh, uh, make determinations of where you might have fixations or blocks or complexes in your life. Uh, and um, the contributions of these, uh, 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 and I, then I can do something about it once I figure out, you know, that uh, why? Why do you have this uh, uh, fixation around water? Why do you have this complex? What caused it? Where did it come from? And then we can resolve it through psychoanalytical projective techniques. Uh, the contributions of the psychoanalysts have been great, uh, largely in terms of language and concepts. You do not see this done much. You don't. I, I've never seen it done at all. Uh, where anyone has used psychoanalysis in. Uh, of the practice of addiction counseling. I've just, I've never seen it at all. But uh, the uh, uh, psychoanalysis evolved a great deal since, uh, since Freud's day. And I had a professor when I was an undergrad who uh, was, uh, I, don't, I don't remember if he was already a psychoanalyst or if he was still working on it. <clears throat> but uh, he said it's great, it's a great uh, uh, profession to get into because uh, you see your patients once or twice a week at a couple of hundred dollars a pop for around eight years and they don't die and they don't get well. Uh, so, you know, I guess you could pay off a uh, mortgage that way. But uh, uh, psychoanalysis has evolved greatly since Freud's day. Uh, and uh, at one point in counseling, uh, you know, for Freud anyway, the analyst, uh, you have a formal relationship with your clients, and you've read this in your book, or should have, uh, where you set up a transference neurosis. You are a blank slate, really, and you allow your uh, client to see you as an authority figure. And the way that they see you uh, and when they see you as that authority figure, they will respond to you as an authority, and that will reveal things about them that will be more grist for the analytical bit mill. Uh, in Freud's time, he wouldn't tell the client anything about himself. You know, as uh, I'm the doctor, you're the one who came to see me. Tell me about you. Um, so it, it's, it's evolved a great deal. Uh, so read your chapter, uh, and um, I think I'll call it a call it a lecture with that. So um, let me get out of this. And back over to to this. Uh, I've tried having live discussions uh, in these classes. They have that, that hasn't worked out well for me, uh, and I I don't mind doing the the lectures for you know my little computer uh, camera and then posting them for you. That's you know not a not a bad deal for me. I don't have a problem with it. 
But the thing I don't like about it is I don't get to interact with you and get any questions uh, or discussions from you. So, uh, you know, if you have questions or discussions, send them forward to me. You can post them on the discussion board just in general for anyone. Uh, or, you know, you can let me know too, and I'll try to all right, try to answer those questions if I can. Uh, guess I'll see you in Chapter 5. If you thought Freud was weird, you hadn't met Adler. <laughs> okay, bye.